Matt Ball is, has been a globally recognized authority on animal advocacy, factory farming, vegetarian diets, and applied ethics for more than 20 years. He currently is the Director of Engagement and Outreach for Farm Sanctuary. Previously, he was Senior Advisor for Veg Fund. He also co-founded Vegan Outreach in 1993 and led the organization for more than 20 years. Let's give a really warm welcome to Matt Ball. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm sorry to everyone who was expecting my wife Anne to be with me today. You're just stuck with me. Um, who, was, who was at our talk last year, almost exactly a year ago? Okay, well, good. Not a lot of you are going to be so bored. Um, so thanks so much for coming out. I'm from Tucson, Arizona. Um, if anyone in the back can't hear me, if I just drop down like this, just raise your hand up, and then I'll know to, to start talking more loudly. Um, I want to start by thanking Linda, Peter, Jacqueline, and Kathy, and everyone else who's put this on. Uh, real quick, if anyone, after the end of this, um, is interested in being active in the area, be sure to join Northwest Veg. I also like Kathy to stand up, turn around, and um, come look up Kathy. She's um, she's on the board of a group called One Step for Animals, uh, distributing booklets like this, and she can hook you up with some. You know, with some good activism in the area. So Kathy's great. Uh, so thanks for coming, Kathy. Thanks for um, everyone who, who came out today. So let's start with a pop quiz. How many vegans does it take to change a light bulb? Light bulbs aren't vegan. But seriously, I want to spend most of the time on question and answers um, so that we can get to topics that are on your mind, anything that, that you want to talk about or anything what you want to ask about. Um, hopefully some of my friends in the past 30 years have told me something that can, I can pass along to you that will be useful. <clears throat> um, so the, the talk is, can our choices make a difference? But I want to start by asking, why do we care if our choices make a difference? Oftentimes it can seem as though what we're doing just exists in isolation. It exists as an abstraction or it's just to fulfill some type of philosophical idea or the like. I want to give you two reasons to care about if our choices make a difference and what difference they can make. Valentino and Clementine. The, the animals, when we talk about the animals or animals and you know, farm animals or the like, they're not an abstraction. They're real individuals who have feelings, they have thoughts, they can have friends, they can love, they can feel joy, and they suffer. Now, I assume I don't have to show a lot of undercover footage here, gruesome undercover footage to, sh to convince you that animals suffer, farm animals suffer in factory farms. But I want to make one point, one takeaway point here, that the suffering, the cruelty of factory farms is not something that's done by a few bad apples. The suffering on factory farms is built into the system. It's something that's inherent to the system. It's not just done by a few bad act apples or few bad actors. Um, as veterinary professor John Webster points out, that chickens are, have been manipulated such that they are in chronic pain for at least the last fifth of their life, even if they're raised under perfect conditions. Here's a graphic that shows how chickens are different now than the 1950s. This is 1957. At 56 days, now keep in mind this is days, not weeks, not years, 56 days, the chicken would weigh about two pounds. Now we have strains that are over nine pounds at 56 days, okay? Now Dr. Harisa Thu would count his blog Counting Animals wanted to put this in perspective. And to put this in perspective would be a 500 pound human being by the age of 10. So by the age of 10, they would be 500. And keep in mind, you know, that's just a human child. And keep in mind that when we kill birds to be eaten, they are still babies. They're 56, approximately 56 days old. They may, be, they may look monstrous, bigger than a normal chicken, but they, are still just babies. 
So this leads to a system that is just inherently filled with suffering. Again, this is just inherent to why we would care about this. As, as John Webster points out, in the most severe example of humanity's inhumanity to another sentient animal. Sorry about the interference. I'll, I'll fix that. Um, so in this, in this situation, it might seem as though there should be no reason to ask, do our choices make a difference? Can our choices make a difference? On the other hand, you get some people who will say that in a world of 7 billion individuals, it's silly to think that one person acting in isolation can make a difference in the real world. A good friend of mine, Jason Gavrick Matheny, wrote a paper that was published in Applied Philosophy, a, a peer-reviewed journal, um, Expected Utility, Contributory Causation, and Vegetarianism. In it, he went through the calculations to show that in a market economy, our choices do make a difference. But I don't really know a lot of people who make their decisions based on expected utility, you know, weighted probabilities, and Bayes' theorem. For example, when I stopped eating animals, I did it because I could no longer consider myself a good person if I paid someone to raise and butcher animals so that I could eat meat. But again, it wasn't about making a difference in the world. It was about me. It was about me considering myself a good person. This is a good example of what I was like 30 years ago. I was concerned with winning an argument with a meat eater. I was concerned with ridiculing meat eaters. I wasn't concerned with really making a difference, of really reducing the number of animals suffering in the world. Now, compared to how I was 30 years ago, 40 years ago, Peter Singer took this question seriously. Does one person acting in isolation really make a difference in his book, Animal Liberation? He's very sympathetic to the idea that one person acting in isolation very well may not make a difference in the bigger picture. Now, I can understand this now, now that I've thought it through some more. Because even if we're the absolute strictest vegan possible, at some point our economic activity will filter down and put more money into a meat eater's pocket such that they can, eat, they can buy more meat. The only way that we can be sure that our economic activity, that our choices has absolutely no negative impact is if we don't exist. So let's set non-existence as the baseline and see what can we learn, what can we do that can do better than non-existence. Now let's, I'm going to back up 30 years and walk through some of the mistakes I made in the past, some of the things I didn't understand in the past. I think perhaps the most useful thing I have had to offer to other animal advocates is to share the mistakes I've made so that hopefully a lot of people won't have to make the same mistakes. Um, so back then, when I was, you know, 30 years ago, I was just angry. And I worried about words. I worried about definitions. I, I obsessed about things like, like ex exploitation and oppression. And I wanted to make sure that I lived up to a certain standard of veganism. The single most important lesson that I have learned since then is that the irreducible heart of what matters is suffering. See, back then, even though I was sure I knew everything, I really didn't know anything about suffering. Since then, though, I developed a chronic disease such that there have been times when I thought I was going to die, times when I wished I would die. Back in the mid-1980s, I didn't take suffering seriously. That allowed me to worry about words and abstractions and debates with other people. That allowed me to focus on my anger and if I was a good person. But now that I know what suffering really is, and how much of it, it is, there is in the world. Well, all my previous concerns seem, I gotta admit, now they seem silly. Today, I realize that what we put in our mouth matters very little compared to the impact we can have with our example, with our advocacy, and with our donations. 
So let's go through a few things really quickly and see what it is that we, what, what do the statistics say, what do the surveys say that can help us be better, be more impactful with our example, with our advocacy, and with our donations. Now, most of you have probably seen this graph from Animal Charity Evaluators. But if you haven't, to a first approximation, this says that to a first approximation, every animal killed in the United States is a farm animal. Now, compare that with this. This shows where charitable, animal-related charitable donations go. And then on this graph, farm animals are this tiny sliver down here. So if we're trying to make a difference for, farm, for animals, just animals in general, we are starting with one hand tied behind our back because we are working with resources that are not allocated in any way proportional to where the numbers of animals are actually suffering and dying. And this is reflected in the number of animals that suffer and die in the United States. This is per capita meat consumption in the United States over the decades. And it shows that while beef has declined, chicken has gone through the roof, more than doubled. Now, keep in mind that this is not you know, one, one fewer burger and one more chicken sandwich. It takes over 200 chickens to provide the same number of meals as one cow. So anytime anyone replaces red meat with chickens, they lead to a lot more animal suffering. Now, I know that most people have a much greater affinity for mammals than birds. I understand that. But we really should take birds seriously. Not just because of the numbers, but because of the incredible suffering that the birds go through every day of their life. Okay, here's another piece of bad news. Let's get all the bad news out of the way first. Survey after survey, including this one by Faunalytics, shows that the vast majority of people who go vegetarian and go vegan go back to eating meat. About four out of every five people who go vegetarian or go vegan go back to eating meat. Now, it would be bad enough to know that we're throwing away 80% of our out advocacy efforts but it is even worse than that because you convince four people, to, five people to go vegetarian, then four of them become spokespeople against vegetarianism, going around telling people, oh, I wasn't healthy or it was too hard or they, vegetarians are, are too much like a, a religious cult or the like. And so we're not, we're not only you know, throwing away 80%, we're having 80% of the people we convince become spokespeople against helping animals. Okay, so what else do we know? This is, a, this is not going to be surprising. This is a graph by Ben Davidow. This is the relative number of animals that are harmed by the standard American diet. And as you can see, it's basically all birds. This is chicken, ch birds raised for meat, birds raised for, birds raised for um, eggs, farmed fish, and then turkeys. And then everything else is this tiny little sliver here. Now, there's another way to look at this. And this is from Mark Middleton at Animal Visuals. He calculates the number of animals killed in both for slaughter and for, through harvesting for all types of different foods, including vegetables, fruits, and grains. And again, chickens and eggs. Mark explicitly concludes, leaving chicken and eggs out of our diets will have the greatest effect on reducing the suffering and death caused by what we eat. Now, again, I don't want to focus just on the numbers because it's not as though birds live a great life. I would much rather be a field mouse living wild and free until being run over by a combine harvesting wheat than a bird whose entire life is utter agony. And I don't mean utter agony as, a, as hyperbole. This is a graph by Dr. Harisa Thu at Counting Animal Skin. This 139 million is the number of chickens who suffer to death on factory farms before they are taken to slaughter, okay? Before they're taken to slaughter, they die from disease or they're just killed because they're not growing fast enough or their heart gives out because it cannot keep up with the gro grotesque growth rate that they've been bred for or their legs break and give out and they can't get the food and water and they, they starve to death, okay? This number dwarfs the total number of animals killed for fur, 
in shelters and in laboratories combined. This is not the number of chickens killed every year. This is the number that suffered to death even before going to slaughter. So this gives you an idea of the relative magnitude we're talking about here. Now, these numbers are just are incredibly stark, and I can't believe it took me so long to realize this as an advocate. Joe Espinoza, one of the co-founders of One Step for Animals, Joe Espinoza ran the numbers by Harish and pointed out that the average American is responsible for the deaths of about two dozen land animals a year. If you convince one person to just stop eating birds, not to go vegetarian, not to go vegan, just stop eating birds, they go from being responsible for over two dozen deaths a year to fewer than one. Fewer than one. That is, that is unbelievable to me. Now, this is the most important slide in my whole talk. So if, I'm sorry if I bored you and you were asleep. If you could wake up for just a second. This is the most important slide in the entire talk. Anything we do that leads anyone to replace red meat with chickens will lead to a lot more suffering. As I mentioned, it takes over 200 birds to replace the, the meals um, from one cow. Okay, Ginny Messina, the world's leading registered dietitian. This should be our mantra. Bad news for red meat is bad news for chickens. Now, anything that might sound good to us, we have to think about how it plays out in the real world. We saw the graph of chicken going through the roof while beef was going down. That's because people are replacing red meat with chickens. They're doing it because red meat is bad for your health. Red meat is bad for the environment. And chicken is better. And, you know, it's true. Chicken is better in these measures. And that's how it plays out in the real world. This is the most important thing we have to keep in mind when we are advocating that we do not do anything that in the real world, not how it plays out in our mind, but in the real world where people just do things better, not best, just do things better. This we have to keep in mind. And every time I talk to someone, they, they ask me what I do, and I say, you know, basically blah, 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 vegetarian. Oh, I don't eat much meat. I just eat chicken, or I just eat chicken and fish. <clears throat> now, what are some of the takeaway lessons? This is, a, this is a chart. I know you can't read it, but I just have it here to prove that it exists. This is a chart from the recidivism study from Faunalytics. This shows that of the people who go, the people who go vegetarian just for health are the ones who go back to eating meat. The single biggest difference between people who go vegetarian and stay vegetarian and the people who go vegetarian and go back to eating meat is the people that who go vegetarian and stay vegetarian are motivated by concern for animals. This is backed up by research from the Humane League Labs, which points out that it is concern for animals that leads to lasting dietary change. So if, if we want to help animals, we have to keep animals at the center of our message, at the center of our advocacy. Now, what, what can we do? How can we shape our message such that we can reach more people, that we can get more people to take steps that actually help animals? So you mainly Labs points out that we should not, when we're dealing with the general public, people who follow the standard American diet, we should not focus on dairy. Not just because of the numbers, that's enough though, but because dairy is the thing that people think that they can give up least. They think they can never give up cheese. I mean, they can drink soy milk or almond milk or something, they're, they're all fine with that. But they are convinced that they will never be able to give up cheese. Why lead with the impossible? This is, this is related to research that I was part of at the MBA program at the University of Arizona. Every single research group there, these were not vegetarians, these were not vegans, I am advocate people, they were just researchers. Every single research group found that the general public thinks veganism is impossible and that vegans are, to put it mildly, annoying. Okay? Now, if all we care about is promoting veganism, of being true to ourselves and the, the consequences be damned, then this doesn't matter. But if we want our choices to make a difference, if we want our example and our advocacy and our donations to really make a difference in the real world, then we have to internalize this and adjust accordingly. We may not like it, but it's reality as of right now. 
Another thing that keeps people eating meat. 43% of people went back to eating meat because they said that they couldn't stand the demand for purity from the vegetarian and vegan community. Now, again, if all we care about is that people who call themselves vegan live up to our definition of vegan, that they don't step out of line from, from what we want veganism to be. They have to be against this and this and this and this and this. Or they're excommunicated and we're going to attack the shit out of them on Facebook. Okay, if that's all we care about, then this doesn't matter. But again, if we want to make a real difference in the world, if we want to get people to take steps to help animals, then we need to understand this. We need to embrace and encourage every single person, wherever they are and whatever step they're taking, instead of reinforcing people's stereotypes and building the world's smallest, most exclusive, and angriest community in the, that has ever existed. Now, there is an amazing opportunity out there. This is the third survey in 10 years that I've seen that shows that about, about half the people in the United States are willing to do something, to consider something about changing their diet, that they question the standard American diet to some extent. I mean, this is an amazing number given that the percentage of vegetarians in this country has just bounced around 2 and 3% for decades now. I mean, this shows that there is an amazing opportunity out there. Now, what can we do? Well, I think it should be obvious from just the statistics so far, but we should focus on the first step. What will get people to take a step that they think is doable, is reasonable, is something they can achieve, and has a big impact on the number of individuals that are suffering in the, in the world? This is it right here. The, the Faunalytics, from all their research, they say it right there. And we, if we can get people to stop eating birds, they go from being responsible for the deaths of over two dozen land animals a year to fewer than one. Unbelievable. Now, how can we do this? This is a graph from the Humane League Labs that shows what is it that's influenced people to change their diet. And it says that of the, of the advocacy tools available to us, movies, conversations, conversations, Websites and online video have proven to be the most impactful. Okay, I know this has been a lot to take in. Just, I just threw a ton of stuff at you in just a few minutes. I, I apologize. We have a limited amount of time. And I want to leave time for question and answer. But I want to just emphasize that it is so much better now than it was 30 years ago that we know so much more about what is effective, what is not effective, what the numbers actually are, and what the actual system is and how people change and why they change. I mean, this is incredibly encouraging to me. I just have two last thoughts I want to share with you. The first is my favorite quote from Gene Bauer. 30 years ago, the same year I gave up eating animals, Gene founded, co-founded Farm Sanctuary. And as Gene was you know, starting with this idea of rescuing animals, some of the most abused animals out there and giving them a good life, he knew, he knew that no matter how big Farm Sanctuary got, no matter how many other sanctuaries there were, we would never be able to save but a tiny fraction of the animals that need our help. He knew that no matter how many shelters we built, we would never be able to divert the stream, the torrent, the flood of cruelty of animals that need our help. He knew we had to go upstream and end the processes that sent all these animals downstream in such horrible, horrible conditions. He knew that we had to end factory farm. He knew we had to end the idea that, that animals can be food. He knew we had to get people to match their inherent compassion, their inherent revulsion at cruelty to animals to their actions and realize that animals are Friends, not food. And finally, a little bit, something a little bit different. This is a quote my daughter found in um, the Ancillary Justice series. Really fascinating series. But the, the essence of this is that you know, we here are all well off. We're all you know, well protected. 
we can, you know, go through the, the veg fest here and see all these other people who think like us, see all these other groups that reinforce what we believe. We can stick to our Facebook feed and just see all these things from other vegans and think, you know, that everything's great and everyone believes in veganism, veganism's on the rise, blah, 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 blah. You know, we are all well off and protected. Now, but it is trite. I know it's trite to say this, but this, what we do outside of here, outside of our Facebook feed, when we're dealing with people who follow the standard American diet, that is a matter of gravest consequence for Valentino and Clementine. It could not be of any greater consequence than that for them. When we leave here, we should know that we have the ability, we have the knowledge, I know we have the passion, but we have the knowledge, we have the tools and the resources to make a big difference with our example, with our advocacy, and with our donations. And we can do this not just for some philosophical abstraction, but we can do it for the concrete reason of Valentino and Clementine and all that they represent. I've been at this for 30 years now, and I have never been more optimistic than I am right now. And I hope that you can all be a part of this every day. Thank you very much. Yeah, just about half time. So we got, um, about, a, we got about half the time for question and answers. Um, if you have a question, just Raise your hand and I'll, I'll come back. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. There's been a lot of press lately on cultured meat, and I, I know we're five, ten years away from that actually being a viable consumer option, but what's your take on that, and, and how can we help promote that? Awesome. Okay, so um, the question was about cultured meat, and I'll, I'm just going to expand that to you know, basically anything that's – uh, cruelty-free, that's meat-like enough to, for people to enjoy. Um, the Good Food Institute, Bruce Friedrich's Good Food Institute, is doing amazing work on the, on the what I call the, the supply side of the equation. So we have the demand side of people not wanting to buy meat, um, you know, advocacy for reduced reduce chicken consumption, go vegetarian, like. And then you've got the supply side where we are going to replace what people eat with cruelty-free options so that even, you know, Uncle, your racist Uncle Jerry is, is going to just find it easy enough to, to just get vegetarian chickens or to eat vegetarian chicken, you know, or eat cultured beef patty or something like that. I mean, I would love to tell you that everyone is going to eventually think just like you and just like you. I mean, that they're going to, that they're going to have a fully developed idea of animal rights and perfect respect and you know, everything like that. But that's simply not going to happen. What's going to happen is that we're going to have people that will stop eating animals and they will, they will create a demand for products that are similar to what they're used to. And then companies will be able to fill that demand and that will make it easier for the next person in line to try being a vegetarian or try giving up eating chicken. And the like, and the, the easier it is, the more people can try it. The more people try it, then the more the more companies will come through with more products. Now, for most of my career, I only thought about the the demand side of things, trying to get people to go vegetarian. It wasn't until about 10 years ago that I realized that there are a lot of really good people out there who just won't give up meat. Um, Ezra Klein, the co-founder of Vox.com Media, he, he did a, an analogy in an interview he did. He talked about reading what the founding fathers wrote about, except Hamilton and John Adams. And all the founding fathers were slave owners, and they all said how terrible slavery was, even as they were adding to their slave holdings. They were like, oh, this is going to you know, fade out over time, and they were increasing slave, slavery. They were not, you know, evil people. They were not people who were apologists for slavery. It was just humans in general are not good at going against the, going against the grain. 
They're not really good at going against the crowd. And we have to realize that. As much as we would love to beat everyone over the head until they you know, get on board with the, the vegan deontological argument, um, it's just not going to happen. It's going to be a feedback loop of, of increased demand leading to increased supply, leading to increased demand, leading to increased supply. So this is why I don't like it at all when people say, don't, don't, don't bring, bring fake meats, don't eat vegetarian meats to, to meat eaters. That's exactly what you want to bring to meat eaters. Um, so the, the, just a real quick story about this. I don't want to take too much time with any one question. At the research group at the University of Arizona, they divide people up into four categories. People who are vegetarian or vegan, people who are very sympathetic to it, people who are kind of wishy-washy, and people who are hardcore meat eaters. Um, and the last day of the class, the owner, um, Sonny, of the, the owner of the local vegan restaurant, brought in the, these chicken things, these fake chick, these veg, vegan chicken things. And one of the guys who had put himself in a, a meat eater for forever, I will never, ever, ever consider anything else, was eating them. And he was like, oh, my God, I could eat this. And, and he, could, he was just not able to imagine veganism. And he had just totally cut himself off from it until he had these things and realized that this could be something he would do. And you know this is this is how it can work. Once people realize that it is not a deprivation for them, then it's easier for them to take a step forward. And so that's why I think that you know uh, arugula and and raw tempeh is not the way forward. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be you know beyond meat. It's going to be gardein. It's going to be you know, the next product that that comes down the pike. And for us to promote that and to get it out to a, a lot larger audience. I mean, you know, tofurkey, I, I, oh God, I love tofurkey. I can't tell you how much I love tofurkey. My daughter, you know, was raised vegan, you know, vegan for 22 years, you know, but she would eat so much meat if she was not raised vegan, let me tell you. And she loves tofurkey and everyone, all her friends, they all love it too. So, and there is enough great stuff out there now that we could really have a lot less suffering in the world if all the meat eaters knew about it, that they didn't think that eating vegan was just, you know, raw kale and, and shredded carrots. So the more we can let people know that there's this amazing food out there, the better. Um, so the question is, what, what do I say when someone says, I don't, I don't eat red, much red meat, I just eat chicken? Um, I actually had someone delivering uh, 10,000 copies of this booklet to me, and that's what he told me. And the booklet's all about, you know, don't eat chicken. Um, so that, that was, that was the, the most ironic um, situation of, of all time, I think. Um, I gave him one of the booklets. Um, I try to have these booklets on me at, at all times um, to, to be able to hand to people. And the, the thing is, it depends on how much time you have with, with people. Now, um, how many people have seen this book? Awesome. Thank you. You have made me a millionaire. <laughs> uh, now, in the book, there's a section in there about how to have a conversation. And it basically advocates using the Socratic method. I don't want to give away the books, then no one else will buy it. But, um, but it, it talks about using the Socratic method instead of, you know, releasing a torrent onto someone about how terrible factory farms are. And do you know what Professor John Webster said? He said it's the greatest case of man's inhumanity to another sentient species. They're in serious pain, and it's because they grow four times faster than these. Blah, blah, blah. You know, people will run away from that. But then if you ask them a question, you know, oh, well, why don't you eat much meat? And then when they answer that, maybe ask another question. And then say, and answer that. Then they ask, you know, did you know how chickens are genetically manipulated? these days. And, you know, genetically manipulated, genetically modified, I mean, these things kind of trigger in, in people. And if you can give them a book, give them a book. It kind of depends on which time you have. But the main thing to know when you're talking to anyone is ask them questions. Most people don't like cruelty to animals. They just don't have it connected in their mind. And you have to be able to get the wall down between what they do and what their ethics inherently are. So, you know, ask them questions, offer them literature. Don't do anything that makes them feel judged in the moment because you don't want to have them feeling like they have to defend themselves 
because that is just the way to shut down any possibility of them changing their mind. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the question is um, where, where to focus, um, he's asking as a student, uh, um, on individual outreach, you know, person-to-person -person outreach about dietary change and then systematic um, changes um, like having your university implement cage-free, um, working on a campaign against Aramark, the food provider, um, to get them to go to, for example, slow-growth chickens. Um, a lot of that will depend on your personality. And some people like to work on corporate campaigns kind of behind the scenes, and they don't, they don't like, you know, having a conversation with someone. They don't like going out and leafleting. Um, and so some of it depends on your personality. But I think it would be, you know, it, it's, this is cheating. I understand it. But it would be good to try to do some of both. Now, I can tell you that when I, when I first would leaflet, you know, 25 years ago, I would actually be um, upset for like 36 hours in advance, I'd be worried about it. Because um, I just wouldn't, I just, I just hate that. I mean, I'm an engineer by, basically by nature, I'm you know, a real introvert. And so it was really, really hard for me to, to get to the point where I could go out and leaflet. Um, but I just kind of forced myself to do it. I guilted myself into it by knowing that there were, that people needed, that individuals needed me more than I needed to avoid dealing with people. Um, but really, if you can't do that, then, you know, try to work behind the scenes. But I, I do encourage you to try to, you know, get booklets, you know, put them on display somewhere, um, you know, hand them out to people, offer them in a class, take a Toastmasters class um, and, and hand them out there. You know, just get them out in, in some different way. But I do think that corporate campaigns and systematic structural changes are important. Now, they're not what we want at the, as the bottom line. But society is never going to go from animals have no protection, no consideration whatsoever, to perfect vegan, full rights for all animals. I mean, it's going to be an incremental steps. That there's going to be, you know, cages abolished, slow growth broilers, you know, etc. I mean, we saw this with the, the turn against veal, um, you know, an ethical argument, and now you know the majority of people in the United States think you know veal is terrible, um, and if we you know can do this, it's going to be an incremental thing. Um, so we should understand that even if we don't want to spend time or give donations to structural reforms, these kind of things are going to be a part of the stepwise change that society will, will require to go from here to here. I don't know if the court will get you, I just want to talk to you. Yeah, and what to do with, you know, well, that's, you know, again, it shows the meat, indus meat and egg industry are getting more clever. Um, and it is, it is infuriating. Um, but I think the broader, the broader question is what to do with anger in general. And, you know, it, I, again, this is going to be a cop-out, but I married well, um, and that, that really – 
you know, was the, the turning point for my life. So Anne's taken, sorry. Um, but dealing with anger is, is really hard because we're entirely, entirely justified in feeling utter, you know, anger and disgust and, and fury and rage. And that just means that you're truly human and you're truly paying attention. And you can't look at things and think, well, that's fine. You know, or that's, you know, I'm indifferent to that. I mean, it's just, it's, it's horrible to know that this stuff is going on or that the, the egg industry is lying about how the birds are treated and the like. The, the, there is no easy answer. Um, somebody would have followed it already. Somebody would have, would have dealt with it. In a, in a way that I could package in a sound bite. And there's, there's not. The, the only thing I can suggest is to know that we can do something with our anger. We don't have to just be angry. We can be a part of bending the arc of history toward justice. And right now, we have done so much, we have made so much progress in abolishing cages for egg-laying hens. Now, I understand, I understand that, you know, hens that are raised cage-free do not live great lives. I understand this. But to be able to abolish this, this horrible, horrible system of torture, and if you had told me just two years ago that Walmart and McDonald's would sign on and then the, 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 the dominoes would fall, I, just two years ago, I would have thought you were high. I, thought, I would have thought you were living in Colorado and getting a, a jump on the, the legalization there. Um, you know, really, we can, we can be a part of this. Now, it's not the end point of what we want, but to be able to have gotten you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of restaurants and grocery chains and food suppliers to, to, to commit to abolishing battery cages, that is incredible. To be able to accomplish so much in the two years. And now groups are turning to, to broilers, to the, the fact that they grow you know, 500 pounds as a 10-year-old. They grow more than four times faster. And they're turning their attention to that and you know, working to, to have people go to slower growing broilers. Now, that's not what we want. But it's better than what we have. And to be able to be a part of this is something that should be uplifting. Again, it's not what we want in the end, but we can keep working for it every day. And now we don't have to just, you know, give a donation to HSUS or PETA. We can be a part of this ourselves. And we can, we can hand out these booklets. But we can also have an influence by, by having a conversation with someone. And one of, the, one of the four main tools that we have available to us to get people to change their, their minds is our conversation, our example that we have with people. And that is immense power. It's not like we have to, you know, change the government. It's not like we have to change the policy of something that's going on in Africa. Every person we meet is a potential major victory for animals. And if we can do something that gets them to make a change that is sustainable and that will, you know, continue to help them move towards compassion, and that is a huge victory. And to know that you can be a part of that, that that's really joyful. The, the talk I gave in Portland um, a long time ago, it's the, it's the concluding essay in, in this book, um, is called A Meaningful Life. And that's, that's the essence of it, is that we can be a part of the next great moral advance of, of society. And you, you think about it, and you think back to the founding fathers, and you know, there was no democracy, and then it was just white men voting. I shudder to think what would happen if that was the case today. Um, you know, and then you know, we, had to have, we had to have a war. And then you know, struggle for, for women to get the right to vote. And then struggle for more, for more civil rights. And the struggle is going, ongoing now. I understand that. And, but we can be a part of that. It, these things didn't just happen. You know, it just didn't wake up one day and there was democracy for white men. You didn't wake up and, and, you know, slavery was abolished. You didn't just wake up and the Civil Rights Bill had passed. You didn't just wake up and, and DOMA was overturned. I mean, these things happened because people fought for them. People were passionate about them. People who dedicated themselves to doing it. And we can be a part of work like that. 
we can end, help be a part of ending this, this, this amazing amount of cruelty. And this is truly a great, wonderful, meaningful life. Some of the best videos online are of kids once they realize that, you know, you know what is really, you know, and they're just they're just horrified and appalled by it. Um, there there are two, not not to not to be Debbie Downer, but there are two concerns with that. One is it's harder to get to young kids, um, and two young kids don't have a lot of control over what they what they eat. Um, yeah, well I. They, they won't. They won't let me come to speak. I, you know, I've, I, I've asked. Um, uh, our, you know, our daughter came home one day from I think second grade and said, you know, I joined the Peace for the World Club, and it turned out she had started it um, to, to tell other kids about it. Um, you know, so I, I was never allowed. You know, I've spoken in high schools, but you know, I've never been allowed to speak to anyone younger than that. The, you know, young kids clearly do have the greatest amount of empathy. It hasn't been squashed out of them yet. They haven't been forced to be complicit. They haven't been forced to, to be a part of the crowd. Um, the, the one, just, just from a practical standpoint, you know, if anyone has a chance to talk at an age level, age appropriate level to, to kids, you know, that's great. And to, to, to push for that, that would be wonderful. Um, one way that people can reach people, a lot of people, before they're as crushed as everyone else, is at college campuses, because you can reach a lot of people on a college campus. Um, they're, they're congregated there. They, there are a lot of them between class periods. And, like, and they're at a point in their life where they now have somewhat control of what they eat. They don't have to do what their parents tell them. And um, they're at a point where they are more questioning of their lives than they are when, when they're older. Um, again, you know, I, I pointed out Kathy at the beginning. Kathy does a great job of leafleting at colleges. If anyone's interested in doing that, I mean, you can reach a lot of people in a short amount of time. It's, it's really empowering and it's great. So um, look up Kathy. She's at the Northwest Veg Table, and she'll be at the Food Empowerment Project Table tomorrow. Food Empowerment Project Table tomorrow. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, you know, um, look, up, look her up. Um, there's some other great leaf litters here as well. Nettie and Kobe are here. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a great opportunity. And you don't have to get permission. You don't have to, you know, convince a teacher to let you come in. And, like, it's just something you can do at the drop of a hat. What do you say is more important, volunteering our time or donating our what, What's more important, donating, donating money or donating time? Um, this is a question I've had with lots of people. George, are you here? Did I, am I not seeing George? I'm very cross with you, George. You said you were going to be here. Um, George, George Price is a friend of mine. Um, he's the tech person behind One Step for Animals. So if you go to onestepforanimals.org or teamchicken.rocks, um, you'll see George's work there. Um, George has, has had this conversation with me. George is a computer programmer. He's in a field where he can earn quite a bit of money, but he has a very sharp mind. He has analytical abilities that he could work for something like Humane League Labs and do unique work that wouldn't get done otherwise. So this is a really hard question, and a lot of it depends on your, again, on your personality. None of this work would get done without people donating money, okay? It doesn't matter how smart, how passionate people are. It requires money to print things. It requires money to run video ads. It requires money to create a group like the Good Food Institute. It requires money to, to travel to something like this. And all this stuff requires money. So at the very minimum, you know, know that you should donate money to the most impactful group you can find. Now, if you have, the, if you have some skills, then you should try to volunteer if you can. If you, ha if you can push yourself to leaflet, even if it's outside your comfort zone, you should do that. If you can't, you know, leave booklets around at like a library or a music store or something like that. 
Um, if, if you want to work in the field, the best way to do that is to volunteer first. Be an intern somewhere um, and learn what goes on in the organizations, what they do, who the people are, what skills they need. That's the best way to get into the field because you, you're not going to just kind of, you know, get a, um, you know, drop your resume there because um, anytime there's an opening in the field, there are gazillions of applications for it. And, you know, I've had, to, I've hired people and I can tell you, you have to find something in this huge stack that stands out. And wor having worked for the group or worked in the field as a volunteer is one of those things that will stand out. Um, so, again, it, it comes down to don't forget money. I mean, money is the bottom line. Money is the only thing that allows this to happen. If you can do something to, to earn, and if you can live to earn and give, and you will have a huge impact. Um, if you're interested in volunteering, see what skills you have to offer. Um, you, can, you can leaflet or put booklets on display. You don't need any special skills for that. And if you really want to be in the field, volunteer first and get, get your foot in the door that way. Okay, I only have a couple minutes. I'm going to rip, whip through these really quick. If anyone wants elaborate, elaborate answers on these, um, look for me. I'll be, I'll be around. Um, okay, the environmental impacts. I, you know, I'm not saying that people should. I don't go out and say, you know, give up chicken and eat beef instead. I just say give up chicken. Um, the booklet, uh, the One Step booklet has all these vegetarian chicken type things in them. The video that One Step uses at onestepthehelp.com you know, shows all these, um, you know, vegetarian chicken things um, as, as options. I, I was an environmental engineering PhD student. Um, I, I was ABD before I left to be activist full time. I did a lot of work in global warming and the like. And I can tell you, I, I feel very strongly that the environmental consequences of a cow, of, you know, one cow is much less in terms of the amount of suffering it creates in the world overall than the lives of the 200 and something birds that, that exist um, if people give up eating the cow for the chickens. Um, I, I feel very strongly about that, and I have lots of reasons I won't go into. Um, can you hit me with the, 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 just a line of your second question? Oh, yeah, yeah, never mind. The, the slippery slope, sorry. Um, the slippery slope, if or the moral hazard, sorry, it's actually moral hazard. If you, if someone says, oh, it's cage free, then they won't care about anything after that. That's not how people work. Um, people don't, don't care about eggs, the, the production of eggs in general right now. Um, they care, more of them care than they did before, and more of them will care in the future. And this is just a way of getting people on the road to caring. Once you can get them to start caring a little bit about how farm animals are treated, that's the way you can get them to care more about f how to have people care about more about farm animals. It, it's not that people go from here all the way to vegan at, because, because the intermediate steps are too easy. I mean, people, people in general evolve to vegan. Um, the Humane League Lab's recidivism, I'm sorry, Fauna Lake's recidivism showed that the people who go ve vegetarian overnight or go vegan overnight are more likely to go back to eating meat than people who evolved to it. And so getting people to take a step is not only good for the step that they take, it's good for having them get to where all the way over here and stay here. And so understand that incrementalism isn't just 
good in terms of psychology. It's good for having a sustainable change. And now, I don't like that in particular. I, I would rather, you know, I'd rather just advocate veganism because that's, you know, that's what I want. That's being true to myself. But I understand the psychology of it, and I understand what the statistics say. Um, so we, we have to realize that if we can get people to take down the wall in their mind of not caring at all about how farm animals are treated, then that's the way to get them to care more in the future about other things. Because now it's part of their personality. It's part of who they are, that they care about how farm animals are treated. They don't want them in cages. But what about this now? What about that now? And th these are the things that are going to have to happen in an incremental way for society, for an individual get, to get from here to here and for society to get from here to here. Now, it's not always going to be smooth like we would want, but it is the, the ugly way that it is going to work out. And we can bend the arc of, just, arc of history towards justice. It's not always going to be smooth, and it's not always going to be you know, always in the same direction, but it will eventually get there, and we can each be a part of that. Thank you very much.